right, good morning to everybody. Uh, delighted that you're here and joining us for the last Plants, Pests, and Pathogens of the year. We've got a great program set for you this morning. So we'll get started. I'm Lucy Bradley. I'm the, the State Urban Horticulture Specialist and the State Coordinator for the Master Gardener Program in North Carolina and your host this morning. We, we also have with us Lee J. Temple, an Instructional Specialist who's our goddess of Collaborate. Good morning, Lee J. Good morning, everyone. You want to walk us through a couple of um, tips? Certainly. So um, what you should see on the screen now is a snapshot of Blackboard Collaborate. Um, on the left-hand side, there is a um, black area um, where you should see my picture coming up, letting you know that I'm talking. Um, underneath that, if you have a question, you can click on the talk button um, and um, use the microphone. Underneath that, there's a participants area. And in that participants area, you have links to show emoticons. Um, you can raise your hand, and you can respond to polls. And all of that information is right here. Uh, below that, you have the chat window. And if you have a question, you can type it into the chat window, and uh, either Lucy or I will direct it uh, to the presenter and make sure that your question is answered. Um, if you have any questions um, for me uh, about Collaborate during the session, you can also type them in the chat box, and I'll help you as soon as possible. What I'd like for you to do now is, uh, if you look on the left-hand side of this map, um, you'll see a toolbar where you can click on the starburst and let us know where um, you are listening to uh, to us from. So I am in Raleigh. Just click on the map where you are, and I'll hand it back over to Lucy. Thanks, Lee J. We've got people across most of the state this morning. Okay, I want to remind you that we have a website for plants, pests, and pathogens. It's a great place to, to go to find out the lineup of speakers, or if you're interested in listening to a recording for a talk that you missed or one that you want to hear again, you can go to our plants, pests, and pathogens website, click on the schedule, and to the year of the program that you want to access, and you can click on the recording and, um, and listen to it again. You also have access to handouts if there are any handouts. We have uh, technology tips for um, strategies for, for being successful with Collaborate and, and other useful information on the website. There's a tiny URL up here in the right corner, 4W7WXOL. We'll, we'll take you to the Plants, Pests, and Bath Solutions website, or you can just Google it. Got a great program today. Dr. Bill Fontenot is, is joining us to talk about certification of, of potting soil, compost, and mulch. We'll have Mark Blevins back with Showstoppers. And Matt Bertone with the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic talking about insects, and Mike Munster with diseases. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Fontenot. Uh, he's going to be talking with us about the importance of, of purchasing certified potting soil, compost, and mulch, why that matters, and, and what it means. Here's Dr. Fontenot. Thank you, Lucy. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I have done a few webinars in the last uh, couple of years. It's always weird. Uh, talking to people sitting down, but uh, hopefully we'll, uh, uh, we'll get through this just fine. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in, and then we'll see what we can do about answering them. I am, uh, we've had technical difficulties this morning, and so I'm actually sitting at Lucy's desk uh, in this process, so I'm kind of unfamiliar with, uh, with uh, the chat info, so somebody may have to get my attention in order to do that. But I really enjoy um, discussing 
soils and soil related information with uh, particularly uh, the Master Gardener group is such a dedicated uh, and interested group all the way around. So if you have any questions um, as we go through this, please let me know. Um, just a little bit, since I can't see you, a little bit about uh, me. I've been at NC State for about 37 years, um, working in uh, uh, teaching and research, uh, mostly um, in uh, greenhouse crop production and specifically with uh, uh, professional potting soils and the like. And then I also uh, established and run the uh, Horticulture Substrates Laboratory, which we set up for helping growers and now uh, uh, consumers alike uh, with horticultural uh, substrate issues. Uh, and I'm the uh, technical advisor for the Malt and Soil Council, a group of uh, the manufacturers of all the uh, retail and professional uh, soil products that are produced in the United States. Uh, and I work with them on uh, their technical issues. And I'm also the director of their national certification program, which I'll discuss uh, uh, a little more detail uh, as we go along. Uh, of course, part, one of the issues that we're running into in certification program is people want to know why we even need certification uh, to begin with. And those of you that have any dealing with um, in the retail soils, uh, know that uh, it was kind of the Wild West for a long time. Uh, people put things in bags. Uh, they called it one thing. They called it something else. Sometimes you'll get the same thing in a soil amendment, a topsoil, and a potting soil. And it'll be the same material in all of them. Uh, there was almost no regulation. Even though each state can regulate these materials, they really didn't get regulated much at all. So we had issues with the wrong things being in the bags. We've had issues with the bags not being actually full. So you've got two cubic feet, and you don't actually get two cubic feet. You get uh, if you take an inch off of a two cubic foot bag, one inch, you can put an entire pallet of soil on the truck. Another one. So you can do just a little bit of cheating and extend your product. Of course, you're not uh, uh, putting the right amount of material in the bag. We also have a lot of False claims in the uh, on these bags that said it is wonderful, terrific, premium, all these things, and they're not really being that way. And so we ended up with some materials that were very good and some with very, very poor quality. So that led to performance issues uh, in the retail side, and we're talking mainly on the retail end, of course. Uh, we end up with toxic ingredients in the materials uh, that we'll discuss in a few minutes. But most of the time, whenever these materials failed. The consumers usually blame themselves. They said, well, I'm not very good at this. Uh, they tended not to go back and buy more. And so that became really problematic. Uh, and so the industry has been uh, uh, fraught with, uh, uh, with, with uh, variation and poor performance throughout uh, some of the materials. Uh, but then they were also being, you know, you're buying it for a dollar a bag. So there wasn't a whole lot of quality that went into this. But a lot of the issues that we ran into with uh, retail potting soils came to a head um, in about uh, after 2000. And we ran into two major issues that got everyone's attention. <clears throat> One was the National Institute of Science and Technology is in charge of developing all the weights and measure standards that we use in the United States. And they uh, have a listing of all the, the uh, the uh, way scales should be done, the way testing should be done, the way weights and measures should be done. And so all the state regulators look to NIST for their uh, protocols. Well, NIST themselves did a nationwide test on potting soils in 1997. And they, they did uh, you know, well over 200 samples from across the country. And when they, they either, uh, well, they measured them either by weight, like a 40-pound bag, or by uh, volume like two cubic feet, three cubic foot. And what they found was 80% of the materials that were used failed. 80% of those tested did not pass. Okay. Now, if you fail a state regulator uh, comes in and does a uh, uh, weights and volume, um, volume and weights test, and you fail, that's a stop sale right there. And that material goes off sale, but the NIST did this as a uh, it was a different process. But 80% of them failed. Well, the uh, 
Molten Soil Council, uh, which is this uh, association of manufacturers, developed a plant manager training program uh, based on uh, some of this issue. And uh, they went around to uh, lots of different organizations. They collected uh, uh, people. Uh, they showed them proper ways of measuring. Uh, they showed them uh, label issues and all these things. And then in 1998, NIST went back and did another test. And in that case, there was only a 20% failure rate of those that didn't pass muster. And of those, none of the ones that, were, that went through the plant manager training program or that worked with the Mobile Soil Council failed. So it was the start of uh, a push toward uh, normalizing or developing standards for these materials. And it was based on uh, weights and measures. Okay. The other thing that uh, got the industry's attention was a situation in Florida where people began protesting outside of a location. And this was on the, the nightly news at uh, the local uh, town where this was occurring, <clears throat> where the people were protesting that the mulch that was being sold was poisonous and causing cancer. And in fact, uh, the, lead star, the lead of the show was red mulch causes cancer. And I know some of you, being master gardeners, some of you have uh, opinions on colored mulches uh, versus natural mulches and, and the like. Uh, but this happened in, in uh, 2005, and they said it was the red, and it was the dye, and this was causing the problem. Well, what it turned out to be, well, we began to look at this to find out what the issues were. Most of the colored mulches were um, started by grinding pallets, old used pallets, grinding them up, and then coloring them either red or black or brown or gold or some other color, um, and using those uh, and selling them as mulch. Uh, upon looking at it a little further, what we found is that these places that were grinding pallets were also taking in other uh, recycled material. And some of this recycled material consisted of old fences and old decks, uh, old wooden structures that were pressure treated. And so the issue really wasn't the fact that it was um, red. It was the fact that or that they were even using pallets. It was the fact that the pallets were contaminated with materials that contained uh, pressure treatment. And it's the pressure treatment uh, back in that day was a material called CCA, which stood for chromated copper arsenate. And if you bought a piece of pressure treated lumber, and if you look on the right, there'll be a little tag on the end of it. And the tag on the end would tell you uh, what, was, uh, what it was treated with. And that treatment is actually a pesticide. And it consisted of chromium and copper and arsenic. Okay. Now, as long as it was in the board and the boards stayed intact, there was never a problem with that. There was very little leaching, very little problem with using that material. And it was a very, very good product. The problem came is when you uh, dispensed with the fence or the deck, and uh, how did you get rid of it? Well, a lot of times it gets ground up. And if it gets ground up, what happens is the CCA actually leaches out. And it gets into the groundwater. In fact, it is actually illegal to grind uh, a CCA treated wood unless you put it into a, um, a specific uh, lined landfill designed just for that. So you can grind it to dispose of it, but you can't grind it to dispose of it in any other way. So basically, it was against the law and against uh, the FIFRA laws to grind this material up. Well, we did a survey of 135 mulches from around the country. And what we found was that 42 of them out of 135 had arsenic in it. Uh, and uh, a lot of it had more CCA. So uh, the uh, Mulch and Soil Council uh, developed, uh, uh, went to work in looking at developing definitions, product standards, and then a program to detect and verify this because they wanted to ban, and they did ban, all the use of a CCA in any product. So any material is not um, uh, allowed in any, any product that has been certified. Um, now, 
looking at old fences sometimes it's pretty hard to tell whether or not it is um, CCA treated or not. But then with both wet chemistry and with the use of, if you look in the lower right hand uh, photo, we have a little, uh, it's called an x-ray uh, spectrophotometer. It's a portable little thing, about 30,000 bucks, and you can stick it literally on a pile, pull the trigger, and you can tell whether or not you get 17 different elements all at one time, all heavy metals. But the ones we were mostly interested in was copper, chromium, and arsenic. So they banned the use of CCA in all products. So the certification program came about uh, by looking at different groups of standards and different classifications. There is a certification for premium potting soils. Uh, generally, those have, uh, um, and you know which ones they are, like the Miracle Grows and stuff like that. Uh, those uh, want to be listed as a premium, and there's a premium price for them. But just because you put the word premium on the bag doesn't make it a premium product. So there's a whole set of standards for premium potting soils. There's also a set of standards for uh, a standard potting soil which isn't uh, quite as rigorous as a premium. There's a difference between the two. Uh, and then we have one for landscape soil amendments. Anything that you put in the ground and one you put in your garden, we have uh, specific uh, uh, guidelines for that. We have a whole set of guidelines for mulches. And then we have a, a category called specialty soils, uh, which are things like people would have, like uh, uh, cactus, uh, potting soils, African violet things. Currently, right now, the only one that we certify uh, in this particular program is for seed starters. Uh, and so those are our uh, certification uh, types. Now, how do you know if the product that you're working with is certified? Well, it, it carries a logo on it. And as you see, here's the, the standard logo. Can they see this? Uh, you can see we're not pointing to it here. Oh. Uh, you can see here that uh, uh, there are different ones, and there'll be a check mark by uh, the one that uh, that this is. In this case, it's for premium potting soil. Right. That will be either on the front or the back, but it has to be on the bag. And every certified, every bag of certified product is listed here for that. And you will also sometimes find the logo on the right, which is something that you can put on the front of the panel, which just shows, tells that it's been certified. Sometimes the certification logo is a little small on some bags. Some people make it large. Some people make it a little smaller. Uh, but it shows that that product has been through the certification process. Now, what do we do? How do we certify these things? Well, we look at several different aspects. One of the first aspects we look at is uh, simply the label. Does it um, do what it says on the bag that it'll do? So if it uh, says it's all natural, then we have to know that all the materials in there are. If it says it grows plants twice as big, we have to have proof. Uh, and so as long as, as long as there's proof, and they have to either supply it or we have to test it ourselves. Um, then we verify that all the claims that they make on there uh, is that. And so we refrain from using words like provides the optimum environment because basically there is no such thing. Uh, but we make sure that every claim that they make on it is true. And you'd be surprised how many non-certified materials are making claims that aren't even close to being uh, true. And there's no one checking behind it. The other thing that we do, of course, is we check the volumes of these materials. All these materials today are basically sold by volume, and so if it's a one cubic foot bag, we uh, test to see whether or not it can hold a cubic foot and whether it actually does. And the, the testing we do depends on whether we're auditing, whether we're doing a site visit, but we always check the volumes. Because that was, in fact, one of the biggest issues that we had was that people were had mm, improper measuring devices at their plants. And so over the first few years, it, uh, we spent a lot of time on volume. But, but now it seems that most people have got that pretty well straight. Okay. We also look at, at uh, uh, per performance. Do these, can these grow plants? Uh, if you buy a soil amendment, will it uh, have something toxic in it? Or uh, can they actually uh, produce and grow plants? 
And so we do uh, grow tests for them. We have two of them. One's a seedling survival test, where we simply see that measures the toxicity. And then we do a grow out. Uh, this whole thing takes about a month for uh, the different materials that we use. We, um, in that process, we look for toxic materials, heavy metals such as arsenic, uh, in particular, and then we also sometimes test for specific species. For example, cypress. Uh, those of you in the south, uh, cypress is a product that's available, and depending on where you get it, if it's a certified product, you will. It may be a blend, or it may be 100%. But there are many bags of cypress that are out there that aren't certified. They don't have any cypress in it at all, uh, and no one's testing that. So if you truly want cypress, then uh, you need to make sure that you're using a, a certified product. Now, the certification testing is done. Basically, we have three areas for that. Any material that is uh, initially brought to our attention for certification, we test it. Uh, we run it through the process to make sure that uh, the claims and the grow tests and everything is done. So we test every product that comes through. And then annually, or sometimes um, twice a year, we audit each of these products from across the country. And we have products from Maine to Washington uh, and uh, Florida to California. So uh, we will actually send people out to uh, like a Florida trip, and they will uh, I'll get uh, 80 to 150 bags of material uh, that will come into uh, the lab for testing on the audit. And then there'll be a, a run in the northeast, one out west, etc., one down into Texas. So we cover the landscape and randomly pick uh, materials on ready for sale uh, and do the uh, testing there. Um, mulches are tested twice a year, uh, potting soils and uh, soil amendments are tested once a year. And if in the audit we are not able to uh, there's an issue and a problem, and if it is not correctable with another sample, then that means that there will be an on-site test. And we literally go to the plant that made this material, and we check out the plant from top to bottom, we check out the initial, and we do another test on-site to see what the problem is. If they cannot, if they, we still, the problem still persists, then, the, then these materials will be suspended and from certification. And generally, they will have 60 days to uh, make a correction and to, to fix it. And uh, uh, then we will retest the materials. And if they're, if they're uh, OK then, then uh, the uh, suspension will be lifted. And uh, then they will be going on. Uh, the first uh, three years the program was uh, running, um, I'm the one who has to go out and, and do the site visits, and I made eight to ten site visits a year for the first three years for groups that were had issues. And for the last three, I'm knocking on wood as I say this, uh, we've not had to go out uh, because the products are all seem to be running up to snuff, and there's never been an issue that uh, we can't resolve uh, through our normal testing channels. Uh, here you can see just uh, uh, an example of some of the materials that come into my lab uh, uh, through from one run, uh, all different kinds. And there will be all different kinds show up, uh, mulches, uh, potting soils, and the like. Out in California, it's more potting soils and soil amendments with very strange things like bat guano and, and uh, vermicomposts and the like. And then in Florida, it's a lot of mulches and cypress and things like that. But it'll be a group of material that shows up each time. Um, the testing that we do, uh, we generally use uh, tomatoes, marigolds, and radishes. Uh, they all come up within a couple of weeks, uh, and then we will uh, test the seedling counts. They all either, if there's if the salts are high, which is in some cases like in uh, uh, mushroom compost and the like, sometimes uh, that's used as a base. Uh, some of these materials won't grow as well, and some of them are sensitive to things like boron and things like that. So, we use these three species in our um, normal uh, survey. If the plants don't come up, or if they don't meet uh, our control uh, standard, then uh, then we have to uh, uh, retest them 
in in the in the growing point. So we can tell pretty quickly whether or not uh, something is uh, is damaged or not. The growth tests take uh, two to four weeks, depending on whether it's seedling or the growth test uh, that we do. Uh, and here you can see some examples uh, from the growth test: uh, the plant on the left versus the plant on the right. Uh, they're, they're different ones, uh, different kinds, and so we get all kinds of differences in quality. There's a minimum standard that the plants uh, in the grow test have to reach, and uh, as long as they reach that, uh, we do it based on dry weight, uh, then they're fine. So they have to meet or exceed the standard for either one. Now, we also run, um, uh, if it's a, uh, a seedling, um, a seed starter, then we also run three additional species of uh, zinnias, uh, impatience, and basil. So we run uh, sometimes six different species, or we run three as our standard. And you can see the lower right here, uh, where some of the plants just don't come up very well. They don't grow very well because there's either toxicities or pHs, or the EC is not quite right for them. And you can see in the bottom right, uh, sometimes there's a little extra bonus in there, and these materials aren't quite ready for uh, the certification process. All right. Most of our uh, people that are in the the process is completely voluntary, and uh, so uh, you and you do not have to be a member of the Molson Soul Council in order to be certified. Uh, but there's a, a, a price break, of course, if you are a member uh, for that. Uh, we do have a couple of things that we've done uh, that add to uh, the standards. And one is on the seedling survival test. We, this is all done on classic tests of two proportions, uh, so that, for example, we have a we have a control that has to come up. And that way, we can tell in January if the plants are growing in their greenhouse in January versus June. They don't grow at the same rate, so we always run a control um, with every test, and then. For example, if our control is, say, 20 out of 20 seats come up in the control, then in a 20 seat test, we have to have 16 out of 20 of the tests have to come up, or else it is different and it can't be different than that. But if we only get 15 comes up, say in the winter time, for example, then they only need to have 11 come up or or more in order for it to be done. So the control is there to. Uh, to make sure that uh, that the environment doesn't cause an issue. And on the right, you see the control soil. Uh, it's a special soil that we've put together, uh, the council. It's, uh, it's a peat, vermiculite, uh, perlite standard type of potting soil, classic um, uh, Cornell mix uh, that we use, uh, that we measure uh, everything against as far as the control goes. There's no fertilizer involved in it. Uh, and so we have uh, the control soils only last for about four months in our process, and then we have to uh, uh, get uh, new control soil. But it's interesting because now that we're using this, it's, it's a standard classic mix. It's not, you know, uh, there's nothing super duper special, and we get a certain size growth every time. And it's amazing because now we have different groups, uh, different manufacturers are now purchasing control soil themselves because they like it because it's standard and uses even groups like the EPA in some states have have uh, <clears throat> bought some of our uh, use of the control soil because it's a it's a good consistent material that they can use for uh, uh, doing the testing even if they're not they're not involved in certification at all but they still use uh, this in, in their control <clears throat> The on-site testing that we do is is uh, a two-day test, uh, and if we are in the process of doing this, then, then something's wrong. Um, in my uh, in my uh, uh, university life, I've been to many different plants and and uh, helped them if they had a question or issue, and I still do that. But uh, as uh, the director of certification program, then I go and I'm looking for. Uh, an issue with uh, a problem. So, for example, if they have a weights and measures issue, uh, we'll do a classic uh, uh, type A test, which we have to do either 12, 24, 48 bags of material um, on the test, depending on how many they have on site. Uh, we can look at them. We look at their uh, potting. I mean, their um, uh, 
bagging systems. Uh, we look at their quality control. Uh, we check their piles for uh, CCA issues and stuff like this. And so there's a wide array for that. Now, interestingly enough, once I have visited a site, I have never, except in one case, ever had to go back and revisit them for that or any other issue. So, and most of the time, it's simply a lack of um, knowledge. They think they're doing everything just right, but their box actually may not be the right size for measuring. Or they were getting the suppliers, they use five suppliers, and they get one that has contaminated material, they quit using them. So it actually makes better for them, and it makes a better product for the public to use uh, materials that are uh, from the certification program. But just the fact of visiting them and working with them uh, has helped uh, improve the quality of these materials uh, across the board. Okay, so where are we now? Well, we have uh, the number varies. We've had as many as 350 products in the program. A lot of, um, and this varies. Now we're about to 250. We've had a lot of consolidation in the industry, and there will be a group that simply buys another group, and then they they take out their products and just uh, one set of products and they put them in. So there's the product changes all the time uh, as far as names and materials. So we have 250 in the program. That comes out to about, we estimate about one and a half million bags at any one time will have the logo on it. So you can find it. Okay, It is, we think, the largest voluntary program of any kind like this in the U.S. And in fact, certain places, many small uh, groups, but uh, Home Depot, for example, requires that all their mulch vendors all their, certify their products. Uh, and that's because they are concerned about uh, arsenic and safety uh, and the like. And they use our program as a way of trying to keep up with this and to help uh, 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 ensure that their products are in good shape. And we've only had a couple of issues across the country. Most of the time I go out and visit, it's a weights and measures thing. Uh, we've only had two issues uh, that have come up that are truly about some kind of arsenic issues. And we actually uh, help. Uh, sometimes when I go visit, it's interesting because I'll go visit uh, a manufacturer. And we'll get done. And I've measured everything. And, and, and uh, we're done. And they say, so we're completely done with the, with the official visit, right? And I, I said, yeah, we're done. And they said, well, look, I've got this pile over here. And it's come in, and I'm not really sure whether there's something in there that I shouldn't use. Can you go check it for me? So we go over and put the gun on it, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's not. And they go, I thought that might be. So they've isolated already, and then we help check them, and it helps them along the way. So uh, now you might ask, well, why is certification good for consumers. You know, it's interesting because consumers generally think that everything that's out there, just like uh, when you buy mulch or whether you buy uh, um, uh, cooking oil, that uh, you know there's somebody that's checking behind to make sure that everything is good and everything is OK. Well, uh, that's not really true unless there is a certification uh, process. Very little checking is actually done uh, by uh, the stores in which they got it. And the states check very seldom. So the issues that we have happen all the time. The problems that led to the certification, uh, the shorting of bags, uh, the improper materials, and the like, they're still here today. Uh, when you're not monitoring these things, if it's dark or if it's colored, uh, people don't really know what it is. And there's a lot of ills that can truly be covered up. Um, easily. And uh, with the pressure for pricing and the pressure for sales, then uh, there are corners that can be cut in a number of ways. Okay. So when, there's, when you're not monitoring, there's always an issue uh, with these things. Now, we're not saying that all uncertified products aren't bad, because they're not. They're simply unregulated. There's a little bit of regulation for certain things. But for the most part, they're unregulated. Uh, the consumers really have no way of telling if the product is good before you buy it. 
And that's what certification does. At least it will do what it says it will do. It has what it's supposed to have in it, and it has an, enough of it so that you get good value for what you spend your money for. And that's all we're really trying to do. Uh, it's interesting because for the past five years, I've, I've been to the National Garden Writers Association meeting talking about certification. Uh, we set a booth up and we answer questions for the garden writers that, that, that write all over the country. And even they have no idea that uh, there's an issue like this. When we tell them about the issues, they go, well, of course, someone should do something about this. But even they don't know that uh, there's uh, these kind of things that can go along. So the certification program is something that we use to uh, just to ensure that you get what you pay for. All right, I, that's uh, uh, now the MSC doesn't monitor, monitor uncertified products. In other words, we don't nationally, we're not state regulators. We are, the Molten Soil Council is a group that um, uh, helps its members and, uh, and tries to uh, enhance the entire industry, but they're not regulators. So they don't check. We don't check everything. Um, oh, uh, the question uh, Lucy just asked me, what about bulk? Um, certification has traditionally only been about bag products. Uh, because of a chain of custody, when you have a bag uh, of uh, mulch or a bag of potting soil, the name of who manufactured is on the bag. So we can find the people responsible. There is no issue. <clears throat> we have had some people actually claim that that some spurious um, uh, competitor has gone in and opened bags up and put things in it and closed it back up again, which we haven't really found to be true. So it's pretty much your stuff if your name is on the bag. But the problem is when you have a pile of pine bark or uh, uh, mushrooms compost sitting there for as a soil amendment, uh, there's nothing that says for sure that that is, it came from where uh, people said it is. Because we've had bags, actually we get bags from certain locations and uh, there's something wrong with it. And they said, well, that bag is two and a half years old, and I haven't sold that account in two years. So you know, somehow those bags showed up on the shelf. Now, state regulators don't care. If your name is on it, you're still responsible for it. But uh, we've had people claim that uh, we, I, I haven't sold that account. So we're not really sure. So bulk products have been a problem for the customer. And so many people are bulk. But as of last week at the annual meeting for the Molten Soil Council, um, we rolled out a new program uh, aimed for bulk users. And it's not certifying the product. It is looking at the plants where they're produced and going through everything from permits to size of the operation to the kind of materials, photos, uh, and information from them that will, and if they pass these things, they can get uh, what we call elite bulk membership uh, that shows that these people are doing things in the right way. It doesn't always guarantee exactly what comes in the truck, but it is a way for the, the bulk producers to participate in a program that, recognition, that recognizes quality and uh, care for the customer. So that's a brand new program, and it's just starting out. Uh, there's no the logos for it will show up on invoices and letterheads and things like this, but obviously not, and maybe on the trucks, but not on the materials themselves. So we're addressing bulk uh, in a number of different ways, and uh, we were just able to. Uh, we've been wanting to address bulk for five years. We just haven't been able to figure out how to do it. So now we're we're looking at it on a plant by basis. So if you are a uh, a uh, producer, and you you have a single site. You can uh, we'll look at your site in the whole process for uh, uh, in, in a way to recognize this. But if you have four plants, all four of those plants have to be tested and screened uh, in order for that to occur. So if you have 50 plants or two plants, 
then uh, we have to look at your entire operation to see, make sure that, uh, that, that you would qualify for this kind of standard. And it, it, again, it's a way to try to help people who really want to go the extra mile and to distance themselves from some of their cheaper, uh, uh, less reputable competition. All right. Well, that's uh, all I have as far as the uh, the way the program is set up, and I'll be happy to answer questions if I can. <laughs> uh, the question is, how do we choose or standardize seed for testing? Um, well. We will, uh, of course, we have the three species that we have. We buy them from uh, uh, either one or two uh, normal seed sources. And then every time we get a, a set of uh, seed that we get, we will do a, a, a test in our standard mix just to make sure that everything works. And most of the time, it does. We always use uh, current year seed, and we um, uh, use materials that uh, Hopefully, we'll be uh, uh, we'll have a high germination rate that's on each one. Any other questions? Uh, Lucy asked me if, if there's some standardized materials. There is a the website that's listed on this last one, the Molten Soil Council. There's information there about the program, uh, standards, how they're arrived at. Uh, all the products that are certified nationally are listed. And so you can actually go to the website and find out whether the products are done that way. Uh, the certification, there's info about the certification program and the like. And uh, all just MaltonSoilCouncil.org. Uh, it is a manufacturer association. My role in it, of course, being a university professor, is is I help develop the standards for these products uh, and materials and develop the protocols, uh, and just you know try to keep an eye to make sure that everything is done uh, according to you know research standards. And then of course we do the the testing for them uh, here at the same time. So. Bill, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, this is Gina. Um, do you run into any problems either in bagged products or bulk with uh, residual herbicides? And if so, what would you recommend um, that a consumer do purchasing bulk with without knowledge of whether it had that problem or not? We don't test specifically for um, uh, residual herbicides. However, I do think uh, that we probably run into that a time or two in our uh, audits. Uh, we get materials and sometimes things which normally have have uh, uh, germinated just fine, and our standards germinate fine, and then there's some kind of strange growth to them. Um, the, but the bulk products we haven't. We, like I said, we, we don't test the bulk products themselves. Um, and I don't really have an answer for uh, uh, for mitigating or problems with that. If the, but I would suggest that if things don't germinate, there's, there's one thing that we try to do just to test to see whether it's toxic, there's an issue, or whether it's just lack of fertility. One of the issues we always run into with bark-based mixes or bark-based uh, amendments, say for example, if you're using a, a, a topsoil and it's basically uh, pine vines, is that bark in itself tends to rob a little bit of nitrogen, and it. So if we germinate seedlings, they will germinate. They will have cotyledons will show up, and then they won't. They'll stall. They'll come. Just they won't grow anymore. Um, 
if they could stall because of toxicity or they could stall just because there's uh, not fertilizer. Now, if it's a if it's a um, um, soil amendment, it's not supposed to have fertilizer unless it says it does on the bag. So what we'll do to test it is we'll we'll, we'll hit it with a little bit of, of liquid fertilizer to see if the plants uh, begin to grow. If they do, then it's a lack of, fer of fertility, and that's not really an issue for us. But we do get stalling, which occurs particularly in bark materials sometimes. But a little bit of fertilizer will cut. And if so, if um, if they can put a little fertilizer on them and uh, then they start to grow, then there's nothing toxic. But if we put the fertilizer on there and then they stall, then there's something else involved. And then that's where we might go uh, get more materials or go visit them, depending on what goes on. Uh, there's a question, how do you can test moisture control soils for moisture retention? Well, that's a little bit of a tricky thing because moisture control, uh, there's two ways that, that retail mixes gain what they call moisture control. One is sometimes they put gels in it, which um, uh, swell up and that have uh, more uh, moisture in it. Uh, and then the other way, though, for some products, will actually have uh, a high quality peat, uh, a good wetting agent, and the like so that the materials retain a lot of moisture and they still have good drainage. And either one of those work fine. Uh, you get better, you know, if, if it is, if, if, you, if you go the second route, that's actually more like a professional mix and you get a better moisture control and you do get better aeration and you do get better moisture retention with those particular products. I mean, that's what they're designed for. So we don't see that as an issue. Where we look at it particularly is in the initial. Uh, like if they put gels in it, we do not pull it apart and see how many gels they have. Uh, but the moisture control is whether they have gels in it or not or they use the other, other system. Um, if their numbers come up like they did when we initially got them, then that's generally okay. If we see gels, if we don't see any gels, then we have to ask them uh, what's going on or we'll get another uh, sample to make sure. So the moisture control doesn't have a standard of it has to hold it longer. It just generally either has gels or, or acquires more moisture and still retains good aeration from the beginning. So it depends on which, which of the sets to do. Any other questions? Well, at any time, if, if any of you have a question, of course, you can contact Lucy uh, or just give me a holler, uh, Bill underscore Fontenot at ncsu.edu, and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you have or talk to you about uh, retail soils, urban soils, professional soils, or any of the uh, other issues that you might have. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Really appreciate your, your making time to share with us the importance of this work. Okay. Let's see. Is Mark Mark Blevins, are you here to talk with us about showstopper plants? No, DJ says he's not. So we will skip the showstopper plants. Those are available if you guys go to the Extension Gardener portal extensiongardener.ces.ncsu.edu. There's a showstopper um, button, and you can get profiles of all of the plants that have been selected for showstoppers for this year. Next up, we got Matt Bertone from the, the entomology department, the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. Matt, welcome. Hello. Um, hope you can hear me all right. We're, we're having 
having some technical difficulties here as well. Seems to be a Murphy's Law day. Everything has gone wrong. Um, we can hear you fine. Everybody hear me on it? Great, great. Okay, well, today, to end out the season, um, I'm going to do a special, basically one and a quarter topics today. Uh, I'm going to basically be talking today about ants. Um, how to identify common ants because these are a large group of organisms found in gardens and in homes and people are going to run into them. Uh, I doubt anybody has never seen an ant uh, and uh, they're just everywhere. So, but there's so many of them that uh, sometimes it's overwhelming to figure out what kind you have. So, uh, ants are in the family Formicidae. Uh, this is a, basically a family of wasps that has become subterranean, uh, although they've returned to the trees in some areas of the world and, and uh, all different places. Um, and they actually new research uh, from a colleague of mine found out just recently that ants are most closely related to hunting wasps and bees. All these things like mud daubers and bees um, things that make nests, so uh, it's a very interesting group of organisms. And of course they are in the stinging wasps, as so some of these ants can sting, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but all are eusocial, now, they are all truly social, which means they have casts and brood care, and also overlapping generations. So all the workers help tend to the young, which are their sisters, and the casts are either just queens and workers, or queens, workers, and soldiers uh, to defend the nest. And they always have colonies then. So they can be from tens of individuals in some of the smaller colonies to thousands of members, um, even some that are millions of members that uh, I'll talk to you about in a few minutes. Uh, and it's actually an extremely diverse group of insects. Uh, over 14,000 species have been described worldwide there were probably at least double that in the world. Uh, so we're talking about 30 to 50,000 species probably uh, when it comes down to it. Uh, so an insanely large group and diverse group of insects. And uh, they calculate that their biomass outweighs the biomass of humans on Earth. Uh, so they're very important, some of the most important organisms in the world. Uh, but in your gardens, uh, so what are they doing? So they're very common in gardens and homes. So there's some that are beneficials, and the beneficials are usually predators, uh, although some can sting, so their beneficial uh, use is outweighed sometimes by their venomous stings. But these beneficials, like this aphenogaster seen, uh, shown up here feeding on a termite, uh, or taking that termite back to its colony, will feed on pest species. Um, one of the interesting things about this is that fire ants are considered beneficial in a lot of ways because they do feed on pests even though they can sting. Um, so, you know, they're good in gardens. Now, most of the pest species of ants, however, are omnivorous. Uh, they're going to be feeding on scraps and sugary substances in your home. They also, many of them will tend sucking insects like these scale insects here being tended by these Campanotus ants. Um, and uh, they basically keep uh, wasps and other predators of these scale insects and aphids uh, away from their cows, if you will, these cows producing honeydew that the ants love to drink. Uh, and also there are obviously some structural pests in ants. Uh, carpenter ants, for example, will excavate uh, wood and can excavate wood that makes up the structure of homes. So obviously there are some pest ants, but there are also some beneficial ants. And the amount of soil they turn over, like earthworms, things like that are very beneficial. And they're cleanup, they're basically a big cleanup crew as well. So um, first thing you need to do though, when you're in your garden or wherever, and you think you have an ant, is figure out whether it actually is an ant. Okay. Um, anybody Want to guess which one of these is an ant? Just put top right, top left, whatever. Okay. Um, don't have any takers, but uh, this is a trick question. 
Uh, sorry about that. These none of these are ants. Um, all of these are ant mimics or insects that look like ants. They may not be specifically mimicking ants, but they come up out into a certain body plan. So we have a jumping spider that looks like an ant. We have this elided bug nymph, this broad-headed bug nymph that looks very much like an ant. Uh, Dryanid wasp, which is a parasite of plant hoppers. And also this ichneumon wasp, which uh, is wingless, unlike most members of the family, and lives on the ground, runs around. Um, so that begs the question, how do we know we have an ant? OK, so ants are very, uh, very easy to tell when you know some things. And I really highly suggest buying this book if you're interested in identifying ants on your own. It's a very inexpensive book, a very small guide, but it lists all the genera of ants in the US and has very good keys in the beginning. Uh, all the line drawings I'll be using in this presentation came from this book. And uh, it's a very, very good book. Uh, one of my favorite books on ants around. Um, so the first thing you need to do is figure out if you have an ant. So to do that, you look at first the head. Uh, they're going to have elbowed antennae. So they're going to have a very long first antennal segment, and then a elbow, a bend right there, and then the rest of the antenna. And the antenna is made up uh, of uh, anywhere from uh, 9 or 10 to 12 segments total. And that's sometimes important in identification. Uh, the other thing is all ants will have one or two uh, petiole or nodes, they're called, but the petiole and the post petiole. And these are between what you would think of as the thorax and the abdomen. Uh, I won't get into details, but it's not the, this is not the true abdomen. This is not the true thorax. Uh, in stinging wasps, it's a little complicated. But we're going to refer to that as this is the abdomen, this is the thorax, and the nodes are in between them. So that's the key features of ants that you're going to be looking for to figure out whether you have one or you have a mimic. OK, so first thing is, of course, ants have casts. Uh, so many ants you're going to see are going to be workers. They're going to be wingless. They're going to be running around in groups, everything like that. But you may sometimes find things like queen ants. Uh, these are winged at first, as in the top pictures. Uh, but after they mate, they tear off their wings and they, bur they burrow underground to start a new colony. Uh, you can actually see that in this picture right here, where there's a little temnothorax acorn ant, which has lost its wings. And it has a much similar thorax to most other insects compared to other ants, the workers. And actually, if you look under a scope or with a magnifying glass, you can see little wing buds or little breaks where the wings used to be. Um, they are similar, though, in shape and look to the workers. Um, and that's going to differ from the male ants. Now, male ants are always winged. They never lose their wings because once they're done mating, they die. Uh, they're basically a very ephemeral thing. They don't last very long. Uh, they're poor or male ants. Um, but they look very different from what you would see uh, with the other ants. So for instance, uh, this male right here is a male from this colony right here. Uh, so very different looking from uh, the female ants and the queens and the workers. Uh, so they're always winged again. They usually look a little bit more wasp-like than the other ants in the colony. Uh, the antennae may or may not be elbowed. As you can see in this picture right here, these are not very elbowed, so it may be confusing. But they will have a node um, behind the thorax and in between the abdomen, a node or two, just like their brothers and sis uh, their, their sisters, basically, and queen. Um, so once you most likely you're going to find workers, but sometimes if you find wing dance, and we got a lot of, a lot of wing dance being submitted because they swarm around the house, uh, you may have males or feet or queens if you have wing dance. So just be sure. And males are very difficult to identify. You need special keys to look at them. Uh, but if you can kind of get practice, you might be able to tell what they are. But let's say you have workers. Okay, this is going to be the bulk of of uh, what you're going to be looking at. 
So you, of course, may need a microscope or hand lens to see these features. Uh, ants are obviously small, um, some very, very small, um, two millimeters long, some of them. Uh, but today we're going to talk about four major subfamilies out of, I think, nine or so that are in the U.S. Um, we're going to talk about the Myrmosciini, the Formosciini, the Dolichoderini, and the Ponerini. Um, these are going to be what most ants that you come in contact with are going to be uh, uh, found in, these, these four subfamilies. All the rest of the subfamilies are kind of tropical or very rarely found uh, and such. Uh, but again, having that guide, that book, is very helpful for distinguishing between the different groups of ants. Okay, so let's start off with the uh, least diverse one that we're going to be talking about today. That's the Ponerini. These are kind of a primitive group of ants. Uh, they have one thick node uh, in between the thorax and the abdomen. And they also have a little constriction after the second segment. Um, they also, most, most of them have a sting, a very distinct sting. Uh, if they die, they often have the sting uh, uh, poking out, so you can actually see it under the microscope. And to me, they look more wasp-like than typical ants. Uh, they're not as ant-like. They kind of look a little more, um, I don't know how, less cute, more kind of evil. So I don't know if that's very good of me to say. Um, but uh, the first one we're going to be talking about is a very common ant right now in North Carolina. Um, it is an invasive, and it is called the Chinese needle ant, uh, Brachyponera formerly called Pachycondyla chinensis. Uh, this ant is very common in soils and rotting wood everywhere around the state, basically. Uh, they're black and velvety, uh, a moderate size ant, uh, about a medium-sized ant, with a fairly elongate shape. And how I identify them is they're basically almost sausage shape. They're very long. They don't have a fat abdomen, and they're not cartoonish like many of the other ants that we'll see. Um, they live in soil and rotting wood, like I said, and most are predators of termites. That's their preferred prey, so it can be beneficial in certain ways. Uh, but they'll eat other insects. Now, the problems occur in that these ants have a very painful sting that they use in defense. Um, and uh, to illustrate that, unfortunately, me and my daughter were at Poland Park uh, a couple weeks ago and walking around. She sat down on a rock. And she said the rock hurt, and she stood up and she said it hurts a little bit. And I looked under there, and there was a Chinese needle ant that was sitting under there, and it had stung her. Now, fortunately, it's not, unless you have an allergic reaction, it's not um, a very dire sting. Last, it lasted about an hour on her. She didn't even feel it after that. Very kind of minor, a little pain at the beginning. But you can see why they have this sting right here. This sting is to incapacitate their prey. Uh, here, a, a Chinese needle ant eating a termite. Uh, so, um, again, be careful with these ants. Uh, they are going to be common in gardens when you're digging. As long as they're not threatened and you don't handle them or touch them, you should be all right. Maybe wear gloves, things like that, if you see a lot of these colonies around or a lot of these ant workers walking around. Uh, but otherwise, unless you're allergic to these types of venoms, it's not going to be life-threatening or very painful for very long. Okay, so that's the only ponerine I'm going to be talking about today. Most of the other ones are kind of subterranean or in rotting wood and very, uh, very small colonies uh, and mostly predators. Okay, let's get to the first ant-like group. This is the Formicini. Uh They have one node, and it's scale-like. It's kind of flattened, um, not very thick. They also, the characteristic for the subfamily is this little... Uh, core, this little kind of tube at the end of the, the abdomen with a fringe of hairs called the acidopore. And this is where they excrete formic acid and some other chemicals that make them nasty, but they can't sting. And these ants are typical looking. They're going to be your typical looking ants. Okay, the first genus uh, is Campanotus. This is one of the largest genera in the world. And these are commonly called carpenter ants. Um, these are large ants, as most of you know, uh, among our largest ants. 
and they are usually black ants, although they may be orange, amber, or red, depending on where you are. But most of them are going to be black, the ones you see. Uh, now, a good way to identify these is that they have an evenly sloping back. It's a very smooth slope. It's not wavy at all. It's basically a nice, rounded semicircle. Also, their antennae attach at the middle of their head rather than near the, near the mandibles. And another thing is that they lack simple eyes. All the workers don't have simple eyes on the top of their head like many insects do and some other ants do. Now, these ants make a living by ro uh, excavating rotting wood. Uh, and they don't eat it like termites. They basically just chew it out and live in the wood and then forage uh, for other things like uh, dead insects, sugary substances, things like that. And of course, because they exca excavate wood, they can be structural pests. Uh, now, the, you know, t typical ants like this Campanotus, probably Pennsylvanicus, uh, typical carpenter ants look like that. But we do have some interesting ones. Um, this is the subgenus Colobopsis, and all of the ants in this subgenus have a flattened face. And this flattened face is used to plug up holes in the nest. And these are very small carpenter ants, and they basically live in the pits of uh, small twigs, especially fallen twigs. Uh, and what they do is they use this head to block up the hole in the nest. And this was found in Raleigh, so they, are, they do exist around here. But not all carpenter ants are made the same. There, there's some small ones, some larger ones, some with these heads, some not. OK, uh, moving on to the next genus, we've got Formica. These are the wood and meadow ants. They are large also, medium to large size, and superficially very similar to Campanotus carpenter ants. Uh, they're, they have more, they're more often red and black, or just black, than carpenter ants. Um, as far as red and black goes. Um, but if you look at them, there's some very distinct differences between the carpenter ants and formica. So the first is that they possess three simple eyes. The workers have these three, these little three dots. Those are the simple eyes that are, that are lacking in Campanotus. The second is that they have this wavy back. It's kind of, it's not evenly sloping like Campanotus. It's got this nice uh, undulation, kind of. And lastly, their antennae uh, will attach near their top lip, basically, rather than up in the top near the middle of their face. Uh, so with those types of characteristics, you should be able to identify these two large ant groups. Um, some, of these nest, some of these ants, the formica, make large mound nests. Uh, ones in Europe called wood ants make huge nests uh, several feet high uh, out of sticks, and they guard it actively by spraying formic acid at the at enemies. So uh, they aren't harmless, even though they aren't uh, defenseless, even without stings. Uh, and I have sucked up some groups of ants in these in this uh, in Formicini, and they have dosed me with some formic acid. It's, it's kind of nasty. Um, and these will actively forage. Again, they're omnivores. They're going to be going out, catching, uh, eating dead insects, uh, licking honeydew, things like that. And you'll find that many ants are actually omnivores. OK. Um, after that is another genus called Lazius. These are the citronella ants and kin. Some of them, like this uh, Lazius alienus, um, are, don't have really a common name. But this other subgenus uh, of Lazius are usually called citronella ants. They're usually amber colored and small. Um, and these are much smaller than Campanotus and Formica. And uh, especially these, uh, the citronella ants, are very small, amber colored, and they have very tiny eyes. Uh, that's kind of one of the ways I identify them a little bit more from those other groups. But they, uh, they do smell like citronella when they're uh, threatened. They do release this pheromone from their mandibles that uh, smells like citronella. Um, I haven't personally smelled it. Maybe I'm not harassing them enough. Uh, but I, I'd like to go out and, and test that out a little bit more. Uh, they do form large colonies in the soil in, or in rotting wood or under rocks. 
Uh, so if you overturn a rock and you see a number of little amber-like uh, ants, it may be laziest. Um, and again, they forage for sugary substances uh, but are omnivorous. Okay, um, and the last form of sign we're going to talk about are the prenolepis winter ants, sometimes called false honeypot ants because they'll store large amounts of fat in their uh, abdomen that makes them look like they're stored with honey. Um, these are small, brown or amber, and shiny ants. Uh, they have very small eyes, I think, on uh, up high on their head and long antennae, and very fat abdomen, usually. To me, they look the most cartoonish of all the ants. Uh, they look like somebody was drawing a cartoon of an ant to me, rather than uh, some of the more typical ants. Um, now, they're called winter ants, of course, because they start foraging in uh, the late autumn and fall, winter, and early spring when it's cold out and all the other ants are, are hibernating, basically. Uh, so they'll come out and uh, forage on dead insects that have died in the freezing temperatures um, or other substances they'll feed on. And they may come in homes. So if you have an ant coming in your home during the dead of winter, it may be prenolepis, the winter ant. Now, one of the interesting things about these ants, uh, a couple of interesting things. During the summer, they hibernate uh, underground, basically. They, they diapause underground. And they have very tiny hole entrance to the nest. And the nest can go down several feet, um, six or seven feet down. Um, so it's a gigantic. Um, accomplishment for these ants. Uh, but they stay down there during the summer, seal it off, wait for all the other ants to go to bed in the winter, and then come out and do their foraging. Now, another interesting thing about winter ants is that they have a huge disparity in the size of the queens and males. So here's a, obviously the big fat queen, and this little tiny male is stuck to the end of her, and she basically drags him around uh, mating, and then he'll unfortunately die. Uh, basically not feeding or doing anything else. And she'll go off to form a new colony. Uh, so um, that's the winter ants. OK, time for a quiz. OK, see if everybody's been paying attention a little bit. Uh, let's see, which one of these is a carpenter ant, Campanotus? OK, A or B? Judging from what I told you before about um, how to identify, how to distinguish that between them. Okay. We got some answers coming in. That's good. Okay, um, I'll give it another five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. All right, we have them almost an even split. Okay, we've got six for A and five for B. Okay, uh, A is the correct answer. So give yourself a round of applause if you got that. Um, OK, so the major difference is, again, Campanotus, the carpenter ant, has a sloping back. Uh, this formica, you can see the wavy back, basically. Uh, also, the if you look at the antennae, they're much higher on the head, closer to the eyes on Campanotus than they are on formica. And lastly, it's a little tough to see in these picture renderings, but you will see three simple eyes on the formica. And the Campanotus has this nice smooth forehead that has no eyes, no simple eyes. OK, well, good job on that one. Um, so that's it for our Formosiony. Uh, so we've gone, gone over the Ponoriony, the stinging primitive ants, the Formosiony, which are kind of the larger, typical looking ants. Uh, now we do the Dolichoderiony. Um, these are very similar to Formosiony. 
and they don't differ very much. Uh, they have a one scale like node as well, but uh, or it's not apparent. It's basically almost absent in some of the ads. But instead of an acetopore at the tip of the abdomen, they have a little narrow slit going uh, going laterally, uh, basically a horizontal slit. Uh, so that's the best way to tell the difference because uh, there are some small form of signs that look like dolicoterines. Uh, so again, a, a hand lens or a microscope, you should be able to see that hairy fringed acetopore pretty easily or not. Now the two major genera that we're going to be talking about here are Tapanoma. This is the odorous house ant. Um, these are the ones that a lot of people call sugar ants, I believe. Um, it's hard to tell from the common names without seeing a picture what the what's what's being called a sugar ant, uh, but I think this is what most people call sugar ants. Uh, these are small, dark brown ants, and one of the best ways to identify them is not by looking at them, but if you're all right with sacrificing a couple of workers that are around, uh, if you crush them, they produce a distinct smell. Now at Bug Fest this year, we Somebody asked, a uh, table was asking what the smell smelled like to try and get a consensus because it's a very strange smell. Uh, you, once you smell it, once you know, but um, it's hard to describe. But the com what they came up with was that it's a combination of coconut and blue cheese, which sounds appetizing, I know. Uh, but it's not that bad. It doesn't make your stomach turn or anything, but you definitely will tell this ant when you crush it. Um, they can have massive colonies with many queens. I actually had a trash can outside with some, a little bit of compost in it, and I opened it up and had thousands of these ants nesting in there with their eggs on the cracks and crevices. Uh, that was fun to get rid of. Uh, but they will make colonies around your home and come in to gain access to uh, sugars and water, uh, crumbs, things like that. And they are omnivorous. And you will see them tending aphids and other insects. Again, the omnivores, they will go after anything that they like to eat. And uh, honeydew is, is definitely something they like to eat. OK, another similar ant, very similar looking, is called the Argentine ant, Linipithema. Uh, these are, again, small, dark brown, but they do not smell uncrushed. Uh, they also. Uh, one of the other differences that's a little tough to tell unless you have a microscope, though, is that in uh, the odorous house ants, the second antennal segment is much longer than the third. Uh, so you've got the first long one, the second one that's fairly long, and much longer than the third. In Argentine ants, it's hard to tell here, but the second segment is about the same length as the third. Otherwise, they don't smell, uh, but look superficially similar. Now. One of the really interesting things about this group is that it's obviously from Argentina, and it was first intercepted in Louisiana, I'm not sure when. Uh, but it has basically gone all across the US. And because it was only introduced by a few individuals, they were all sisters. And so they don't hate each other. Well, maybe that's odd. But uh, they really don't fight with each other. So colonies next to each other will not fight and will actually become super colonies. And so one of the interesting things about this is in the entire state of California, there is one colony of Argentine ants. Uh, you can take ones from Los Angeles and bring them up to San Francisco, and they will not fight. So technically, they have one gigantic colony with many thousands of queens in the entire state. And that, that seems to be some of, somewhat of the case here in North Carolina as well. Again, they're omnivores, and they love sugary substances. Um, and they can, they have been shown to promote scale insects. So again, treating for ants can sometimes also help uh, for uh, controlling your scale insects and aphids because they drive away natural predators and parasitoids. Okay, so that's it for the Dolichoderini. There are a couple other genera in the U.S., but they're not as commonly encountered. So lastly, let's talk about the Myrmicini. These, this is the most species rich and has the most genera of all of the ants in the US. And we're well, going to be discussing many of them uh, today. So uh, unlike the other, the previous groups, these ants all have two nodes. They have the petiole and the post petiole. 
Many of them also have spines on the back of their thorax, uh, which are kind of distinct. Um, and also, some of them will have sting. So not all of them will have a sting, but some of them will. And again, they're kind of typical looking for ants, but be sure to make sure you check about those two nodes. Okay, the first one, if anything, this will be the easiest one to identify of all ants, and I hope that if you get anything from this talk that you can identify chromatogaster or acrobat ants. Acrobat ants are small, very diverse group worldwide, um, and the easiest thing to identify them with is they have this heart-shaped abdomen when viewed from above. Another thing, very, very distinct uh, part of this genus is that their petiole attaches high on the abdomen. It basically attaches to the top of it. Very odd for ants, and it actually lends to their behavior of holding their abdomen up in the air when they walk. And that may be why they're called acrobat ants. They look like they're balancing. Uh, so if you see ants kind of holding their abdomen up, walking down up and down trees, it's probably chromatogaster. They also often have spines. Almost all of them have fairly large spines. And they can sometimes be bicolored, like this red and black one, or brown one. And, uh, but some can be unicolored black. Now, they usually live in trees, and they may enter homes. They're actually fairly common in homes, and sometimes even nest in the walls of homes or in uh, outside on porches in the wood. Um, and they are active foragers and omnivorous. So again, they're going to be tending. They can tend scale insects and aphids and also eat scraps or eat sugary substances uh, in your home. But hopefully, the heart-shaped abdomen and the high attachment of the petiole should tell you exactly that you have acrobat ants. OK, now an ant genus that everybody is familiar with, I hope, and maybe not uh, happy with, obviously, uh, the Solenopsis, the fire and thief ants. So they're very t small to tiny. Uh, the red imported fire ant, or RIFA, has an abdomen that's dark, while, whoops, while the rest is, uh, is dark, while the rest is reddish brown. Now, Solenopsis is, fortunately, very easy to tell from all other Mimosine ants and all other ants, basically, or all other Mimosine ants, in that they have a 10-segmented antenna with a little two-segmented club at the end. So that's the easiest way. If you have the two nodes, like you see here, and this 10-segmented antenna, then you have a fire ant. But, of course, there are other ways to identify them. Most commonly, the large nests that are built in disturbed areas, uh, usually around construction sites, meadows, uh, lawns, basically anywhere where humans have kind of dug up the natural area and you've got weeds and grasses growing. So you really won't find them very much in the deep woods or even inside the woods. They're mostly going to be found out uh, in places like gardens or lawns, places like that. Uh, and obviously, they sting. Uh, this is well known among most people that live in their range. Now, what people don't know also is that in the same genus, Solenopsis, there are thief ants. These are very small soil-dwelling ants. They are about two millimeters long, some of the smallest ants we have, and they're much smaller than the red and fire ants. Uh, they live in the soil, and they can sting, but they have very weak stings to humans, and they're really not coming up on the surface. Um, but anyway, if you're digging around the soil, you see these little tiny ants. They're also going to have 10-segmented antennae, uh, two-segmented nodes, and a, a two-segmented club at the end of the antenna. Okay, um, another very common ant uh, in the Mimosini is, the, is Monomorium, the pharaoh and little black ants. Little black ants being much more common uh, than pharaoh ants. They're very small, about two millimeters long. Uh, little black ants, as the name implies, are shiny and little and black, whereas pharaoh ants are brown. Uh, these ants usually move in slow, organized lines to search for food. You, they're kind of cute in the way that they walk in a nice line, nice straight line, and very slowly. Um, and they do often come into homes because they are omnivorous, again, searching for food. Here you can see a a uh, piece of something on a couch, um, 
And uh, of course, these ants are loving it. They're they're eating that, and that's a nice food source for them. Uh, and here's a bunch of them inside a dandelion uh, bloom. So again, they're going to search for nectar and sugary substances and crumbs, things like that. Um, and uh, they may come into homes, like I said. Pharaoh ants are always indoors in cooler areas. So they never nest outside. They're always indoors because they need warmer temperatures. And of course, the little black ants are very common around everywhere. I have pictures from Oklahoma and North Carolina, and it's the same species. Okay, um, now Tetramorium, not to be confused with Monomorium, these are the pavement ants. They're small, but not tiny like the, like the others, like the uh, thief ants and the little black ants. And they're kind of a dark brown, but the most distinct features of them are that they have all these ridges on their head. They almost look like a fingerprint, like they weren't done cooling yet, and somebody put a finger on their head and left a little fingerprint mark. They also have these very large antennal sockets uh, where the antennae attach to the head, and that's the characteristic for the group. Uh, they're called pavement ants because they usually nest on their paving stones or in soil around stones, uh, but they can nest in many different areas. And uh, one of the interesting things about them is they often have large intercolony battles for territory. So here's a big fight going on, and there'll be many dead ants left afterward. Um, and basically, there's huge battles to fight for territories. But again, if this one actually was coming up from some cracks of soil near some marble, um, and so again, they don't nest near structures like that. Fairly common ant. Okay, uh, another myrmecine, of course, has got the two nodes here and spines. Uh, this is a phenogaster. It looks a little bit tough to, to uh, uh, pronounce, but the common name that's been given to them is winnow ants. Um, they're medium-sized ants. They're much larger than most of the ants that, we're gonna, that we've seen already, smaller than carpenter ants, but larger than typical ants, and very slender looking, very graceful kind of very slender ants um, with usually a lot, oftentimes a little neck even. Um, and they're two-toned brown and light or light brown, reddish brown, uh, with a roughened body and a shiny abdomen. Uh, these ants nest in rotting logs or trees, uh, but sometimes elsewhere near rotting, near compost piles, uh, etc. Again, these are also omnivores. You saw the one taking the termite away in the earlier slide. Uh, but they also enjoy seeds, and some seeds have these special fruit bodies, these special fat bodies that actually promote the distribution by ants, and what they'll do is they'll bring these seeds back to the nest, eat this, eat this coating off, and leave the rest of the seed intact, and the seed has this beautiful place to grow inside the nest of the ant. So they can actually help uh, contribute to um, the growth of certain plants, too. But again, these are very common woodland ants, uh, rotting wood that can even excavate in trees a little bit where there's decay. Um, but very distinct dance, spines, graceful, uh, rough and then smooth, and uh, kind of a neck on them. Okay, now to the largest, uh, this, this genus Fidoli, called big-headed ants, uh, is the largest genus of ants in the world. There are over a thousand species in the world uh, just in this genus. Uh, the best way, it's a little difficult when you just have the minor workers, but the best way to identify them is if you see a lot of workers and you see these regular looking ants on side by side with these larger ants with big heads, that's the best, get, that's the best way to identify them as Fidoli. Uh, otherwise, they're a little difficult to identify on their own. They generally have smallish eyes um, and they're kind of a little, they're usually uh, amber or brown. Um, fairly difficult to identify otherwise. Uh, but if you get one of those books, you should have no trouble doing it so. Uh, they are omnivores as well, uh, and they nest in ground in natural areas, uh, in meadows or in woods. So these were both taken in my garden at home, um, this one on a daylily, and this one just on the uh, retaining wall of the garden.
Okay, so this one, this ant species, uh, Pogonomyx batius, the eastern harvester ant, is more for people in the coastal plains and and the coast um, near the Piedmont and uh, the mountains, especially. They're not going to be found. Uh, they prefer sandy soil, as shown in this picture right here. Um, and uh, very interesting ants. They uh, are polymorphic, so the the workers can come in several sizes. But they all look fairly similar to each other, not like the big-headed ants. Um, and uh, they're reddish brown with these wide heads. And again, like Tetramorium, like the pavement ants, they're going to have what look like fingerprints on their heads. Uh, but their nests are the most characteristic. They basically nest in open sandy areas and clear out the area around the hole. Uh, entrance uh, for several feet, um, and then basically. Yeah, just a quick time uh, check that we're at 11:32. Right now the mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, anyway, uh, these are seed foragers, and because they're seed foragers, mammals will rodents will try and come and get the seeds. So they actually have a very strong venom against mammals. They are actually the most venomous insect or animal land animal in North Carolina. But they have such small amounts of venom, and they're not aggressive. So you shouldn't really be too afraid of them. You can observe them very well. Uh, they don't attack regularly. But just be, no, be sure to know that they can sting and have a very potent and painful venom. OK, so that was my last uh, name sign. And so those are the, the ants that you're going to want to look out for um, and senior garden, senior properties. Uh, but just know that we do have a very good ant diversity here in North Carolina. You may not see these groups, but we have things like army ants. This is actually a specimen sent in uh, from North Carolina resident to our clinic. So we have our local army ants. We have our local fungus ants, like the leaf cutter ants in the tropics. These were found dead on my car mating. Uh, well, I guess they weren't mating if they were dead, but they had been. Um, this was in Schenck Forest in Raleigh, a trap giant, a minute trap giant called Strumigenes. And lastly, in my front yard, one of my favorites, a Dracula ant, an ant that actually feeds its larvae solid foods and then it drinks the blood of its larvae to gain food as adults. And these, these wounds heal and everything. It's called, um, um, I forget what it's called, but it's uh, basically a strategy by these ants to feed their larvae solid food and then get liquids for the adult ants. Very strange. but. Learn more about the ants. Um, I will post. I'm going to actually copy in the chat a um, some links, some links for some great uh, more information and more photos. Uh, Alex Welp uh, has a lot of these photos. I use some of the photos that I use in here is a very good photographer, especially on ants. Okay, let's move on uh, very quickly to uh, overwintering insects. So some insects hibernate as adults indoors. Um, and they may become a nuisance, especially if they come into your living areas and swarm. Um, some can even bite or, or leave nasty stains and feces, things like that. Uh, they're often in attics and areas with easy access from the outside, uh, including sheds and barns, uh, et cetera. And many of individuals may roost together uh, and then may emerge during warmer days. Uh, so just to list the ones that you might be seeing, uh, so ladybugs tend to do this, especially Harmonia, which is the multicolored Asian ladybug uh, seen here, and uh, the convergent ladybugs, Hippodamia convergence and, and its groups. So be on the lookout if you start to see a lot of uh, ladybugs, you may have an issue of them overwintering in your home. Uh, cluster flies, it's a type of blowfly that parasitizes earthworms. But the adults overwinter and will come into homes or come onto homes. Uh, the best way to identify them is they have these nice golden hairs all over the thorax. Um, but otherwise, they, they may be entering your homes during the winter. Kudzu bugs. Everybody loves dealing with these, I'm sure. Uh, they're a big problem uh, right now in North Carolina. Uh, individual bugs are all right, but they start to congregate. This is uh, on the steps of the museum downtown in Raleigh. Uh, but they will do the same on the sides of homes and inside homes. And keeping with the bug theme, there are actually a lot of bugs that overwinter as adults. Um, 
of course, the brown marmorated stink bugs. And here's another stink bug. Uh, the story behind this is that I had uh, some in-laws bringing in some chairs for a Christmas dinner from a barn. And they were coated with brown marmorated stink bugs. And they had this one other stink bug hanging out with them. So they will come into homes. They are stinky. Uh, basically, uh, you've got to uh, tell you how to deal with it in a second. And lastly, other bugs like box elder bugs and leaf footed bugs. Um, so, what can you do? Um, seal openings in your home and pay close attention to the south side of the home. This is the part of the home that's going to get more of the warmth in the colder months. Uh, so, the outside of the home may be sprayed with pesticides beforehand, but uh, it's not a great idea to do it yourself. Um, Check the attics in the late autumn, especially if insects come into living areas. And uh, the ways to tr control are to either vacuum them up. That's probably one of the best ways. Uh, just vacuum them up and deal with them. Or if it's very severe or you're no, not getting good control, call a pest control operator that may be able to spray a little bit outside. Probably not inside the house, but outside of where the walls and the uh, entrances are. Okay, um, now we're going to go into a small section before I turn it over to Mike. Um, we are going to be talking about garden legends, garden myths and legends. Um, so we, we solicited some from the audience and we didn't get anything, but we've come up with our own uh, for, for everybody here. So garden legend number one, uh, it is illegal to kill praying mantises. I've heard this one. Uh, you used to hear this a lot more in the past, but not much recently. But you may hear this. People don't want to kill praying mantises, or they find a dead one, and they want to, want to know who to prosecute. Um, but honestly, this is uh, false. Uh, most of the large mantises that you find in North Carolina are going to be exotic. The Chinese mantis, the Japanese mantis, the European mantis, and thus they're not protected. Our native mantises probably shouldn't be killed either, but they're not endangered and there's no laws regulating whether you can kill them or not. Uh, I don't see why many people would, but it's sometimes a misconception uh, that I've heard, at least in the past. Um, garden legend number two. Daddy long legs are the most venomous organisms around, but their fangs aren't big enough to bite. This is one I hear very often. Um, and uh, I see I've got a comment. One mantis tried to catch a hummingbird on my feeder. Yes, that will happen. Uh, they are indiscriminate predators. And so that's why I kind of uh, temper the benefits of praying mantises when people uh, tout them so much, because they will eat even beneficial organisms and vertebrates, things like that. But they're generally good to have. They're going to be eating a lot of different things in the garden. I prefer paper wasps and hornets, even though they sting, because they specifically go after soft-bodied insects like caterpillars and such. OK, back to the day long legs. Um, the, this is obviously false. Um, true daddy long legs, aka harvest men, uh, do not have any venom at all. They actually have claw-like mouth parts. Uh, whereas other daddy, things people call daddy long legs, cellar spiders in particular, I uh, only have very weak venom, and there was actually a Mythbusters episode that busted the myth uh, that they are venomous enough to kill you. And they have very weak venom. They use their web and entrapment and snarement to actually get their prey better. OK, and lastly for me, garden legend number three. Peonies won't open until ants lick away the sticky sap around the petals. This is one I've heard uh, several times I, I was not aware of until I talked to some mass gardening clubs. Um, this is, it seems likely, but it is actually false. Uh, peonies will open without ants helping them. Uh, however, the plant may benefit from the presence of the ants driving away herbivores. Uh, this may be why these extra floral nectaries are present. They may attract the ants. The, the flowers may be inadvertently attracting the ants which then scare away other organisms that might feed on the bud or the bloom. Um, and with that, is uh, Mike here? I am. Oh, great. OK, well, um, I'm going to turn it over to Mike now. 
All right, continuing with our garden legend theme, one uh, idea that is out there is that we should be spraying water on plants to try and control powdery mildews because powdery mildews don't like water. As it turns out, there is a grain of truth in this. In fact, the germination of the spores of powdery mildew is interrupted or at least uh, deformed if there's liquid water present, what we call free water. But if you think about it, when we've got rainy weather, it's actually accompanied by high relative humidity. So my very casual observation was that in rainy weather, we've got more powdery mildew than we do in dry weather, even though the liquid water itself is not beneficial to the powdery mildew. And besides, we don't want to be spraying our plants with water indiscriminately because we're going to favor other kinds of fungal and bacterial diseases. Here's one that uh, I have heard from my wife, and it would seem to be reasonable that if you've got a plant on a hot sunny day and you spray water on it, that you're going to shock it somehow, either through the soil or on the leaves. Or the other idea that's associated with this is that somehow the droplet of water, I don't know if you've heard this one, will act like a magnifying glass concentrating the sun's rays into a lethal concentration and then uh, burn the leaves. Turns out though that this legend is false. I checked with Dr. Brian Whipker about the first aspect of it and he assures me that in fact watering, either spraying water on leaves or watering soil is used to cool plants down on hot days to relieve the stress of the heat. Although I can't, uh, I did not ask him specifically what kind of temperature water we're talking about here. As far as the magnifier effect of water drops, if you think about it, uh, anyone who cares to admit that at one time they tried to start a fire with a magnifying glass knows that you can't have the glass right up next to whatever you're trying to burn. It's got to be some distance away to focus the sun's rays. So that really would be a neg negligible effect. Now I have seen a little bit of damage that I would attribute to the evaporation of spray droplets. If you're spraying some kind of pesticide perhaps, um, where as the water evaporates and the pesticide concentrates, you might get a little damage there. But there are certain things that you don't want to apply on hot days anyway, sulfur in particular. And of course, you would want to challenge me on the uh, false at the top here by reminding me that, in fact, African violets do develop ring spots on the leaves if you water them with cold water. So it's not a 100% false statement. Garden legend number six, our last one of the set, and I think the most interesting here, it's been considered common knowledge that the galls that occur on forsythia stems were caused by the fungus Phomopsis. Well, this turns out to be false. Phomopsis had been isolated from this kind of galls, but the paper that was published actually many years ago now, I have to go back and look up the date, where they tried to re-inoculate the fungus onto the plant and see if they could reproduce those symptoms was a failure. And now we're still at the isolation stage. I don't know if the inoculation studies have been completed, but it, this makes a lot more sense. They found the bacterium Pseudomonas sevastinoi in this kind of galls which are known, for example, to cause all of not, and we'll talk about that particular bacterium in, in a little bit. So there's just a little quick sampling of what we would uh, call our garden legends, and again, encourage you, any of you who have some of these ideas, to send them to us, and we can either try and confirm or deny and report out on another plant's pests and pathogens. Right, let me go very quickly then through, through a few of the current diseases or the diseases that we've seen since we last met on PP and P and some things to look out for over the winter. We had a rash of Phytophthora root rot diagnoses in the landscape. In fact, from September 1st to October 7th, we had Phytophthora diagnoses on four Leyland cypress samples, four boxwoods, two azaleas, and two arborvitae, all from home ground. What happened here? Well, I think it was that the very wet weather we had early in the year, spring and, then the, and much of the summer, really set up the root rot. The Phytophthora got, um, got the boost from all that extra moisture, and then when the rain stopped and the water stress started to set in, the trees started going down. Here's a case that was particularly interesting because if you look to the 
right of the tree on the right, the dead tree, this is where a drain comes out from a roof. Some gutters were installed or rain, uh, I'm sorry, a, a drain from some gutters was installed and it came out right there, which of course would have saturated the soil around the plant that died. So the prospects are not necessarily good for the adjacent plant either. Here's another situation that uh, was at least not uncommon where a row of trees had the lowest part of the row affected. Again, where water would tend to accumulate here and one tree was already removed where you see the space and this other tree as well affected. I want to take a few slides to talk about lumps, bumps, and burls. This photograph is from a park near where I live in Garner. And a lot of times when these sort of growths are seen on trees in particular, it's not going to be possible to say what exactly caused them. There could be some kind of a, a organism involved in, in there, but really we often see burls that will grow, become quite large. The tree reaches a ripe old age and seems to make it just fine. But in some cases where we see galls or other kinds of lumpy growths on plant stems or roots, we do know that there's a disease situation going on. And so I want to talk about a few of these. And it's interesting, too, um, how many of you, you can use your little uh, check thing, how many of you have seen the animated film Epic? It looks like so far about uh, two out of four have, have seen that. Not, uh, three out of six, about half anyway. Uh, I saw it over the weekend. Uh, my kids really liked it. I liked it too. Not that we're here to provide movie reviews, but there's a scene or two in that film where the enemies of the protagonists are firing arrows, and if those arrows happen to hit a tree stem or branch, it bursts out into a small gall, looking very much like some of the things that we'll show here. All right, this is a sample that came in, uh, or photographs. I don't remember if the physical sample came in. It was one that Sean diagnosed. Laura Pedalum from Gates County earlier this month. And we see this particular problem maybe twice a year, either from the landscape or even more often from a nursery situation. And it turns out that this is a bacterial gall on lower pedalum caused by Pseudomonas sevastinoi. Now, you remember that was the one I mentioned as having been found in the galls on Forsythia. But these apparently have different strains that are specialized to some degree or another on different hosts. So olive knot is another one. And the photograph that was just sent in this morning and I was asked to comment on was this oleander from Dare County, and this is probably also another strain of Pseudomonas sevastinoi. And the question was, can this spread? Well, yes, it can, so you definitely do not want to propagate from this plant. And if you prune the galls out, you want to make sure and sanitize your shears between cuts. I don't know of any kind of uh, insect or other mechanism by which these are spread around, but uh, again, sanitation would be the key to trying to get ahead of this. And if it becomes necessary, you may have to remove and replace that particular plant. Another sort of gall that we see and we'll be seeing more as the leaves drop from the trees would be this one here. For the sake of time, I won't stop to ask if people recognize these. I'll just go ahead to the answer. This particular one came from uh, last year on a cherry tree. And it is, of course, our old friend black knot, which occurs on both cherry and plum. And the fungus is now named Apiosporina morbosa. Most of that tissue, though, is actually host tissue, plant tissue that has been stimulated to form that particular growth. But the fungus spoilates on the surface. Again, basically, pruning or learning to live with it is going to be your solution. This is, I apologize for the photo of uh, being as grainy as it is, but this was taken at a park 
when I was out with the family a couple of Sundays ago, and we had this growth on American Beach. <clears throat> Some of you may have seen this before. We don't get it off in the clinic. I don't know if because people are not seeing it or if they're seeing it and they already know what it is. Well, this is actually a type of sooty mold. The fungus is known scientifically as scorious spongiosa, and the uh, peach sooty mold would be, I guess, a common name for it. And you'll notice what it's doing is it's actually growing here, but on the honeydew dripping from the beech woolly aphids, whose scientific name I would struggle to pronounce. Maybe Matt, can you pronounce the name of this thing? No. <laughs> I'll have anyway, to, I'll have to, I could try, but yeah. Um, the the point here being that this is not actually damaging the tree in and of itself. It's just growing very abundantly on the city mold, and sometimes just leave it fall off on the ground, and you find it on the ground underneath the tree. This would be a more conventional type of city mold, either patches or, in this case, following the veins, and do what I teach my students the finger test, the thumbnail test, to see if it'll rub off and you know it's not a true leaf spot. It was just sooty mold growing on honeydew. Here was a picture that came in from uh, Tom Glasgow, uh, apparently took it from Craven County on Muscadine Grape last month. And to maybe get a little bit easier look at it, I want to show a different plant with something similar on it. This came from campus here. It's creeping flocks. And we'll notice that there are a lot of spaghetti, thin spaghetti-like angel hair orange strands wrapped up in this. And what it turns out to be is actually daughter. Notice the flowers and the seed capsules. This is a parasitic seed plant, a parasitic flowering plant that derives its nutrition since it doesn't have chlorophyll uh, from the Plant that it is, uh, the plant that is growing on. Here, I am embarrassed to say, but that didn't keep me from saying it, that I didn't pay close attention when I pulled over and took this picture as to what the host was. I believe it was a willow oak. This was uh, seen on another family expedition. We were coming through uh, the town of, let's see, it was Wendell, and noticed these conks growing out of the side here. It's not a gall. This is actually a fungal fruiting body growing on the side of this. And you notice it's also associated with a canker. And this is what we call canker rot caused by the fungus Inonotus hispidus, which particularly would be found on oaks. It's a more of a reddish color when it's young, but can darken to this very black color here. And another interesting thing about this, other than that it's a wood decay fungus that causes disease and, and canker, is that this is one of the fungi that can be used for dyeing wool or silk. And it'll give you different shades depending on what mordant is used. So for those artisans out there at the village of yesterday, here's something to, to think about. Quickly going through our be on the lookout list for the next few months. Um, Woody ornamentals, I again want to remind everybody to be aware of and looking for box blight. We talked about that last time. Picture in the lower left here. Typical lesion. As other trees go bare and the ligustrums keep their shiny green foliage, we'll start to see some yellow diffuse spots on it that may develop necrotic or dead centers. And this is going to be Pseudocercospora or one of its relatives causing that leaf spot. It's not a issue that's going to threaten the life or long-term well-being of that particular plant, but it does sometimes cause uh, noticeable leaf spotting. In the flower beds, we've got to be aware of black root rot of pansy and viola. And also, as the weather gets wet, we may see some botrytis, especially in pansies. This picture shows botrytis. You wouldn't necessarily recognize it right away um, because it can mimic a little bit some other things that it would be going on in the roots. But here, it's actually a blight that's occurring on the foliage. And it's hard to see here, but probably started out in that dead blossom and then spread from there to the leaf tissue. Claritinia blight might show up in a snapdragon here or there, and it would be more of a problem 
actually in the vegetable garden, which I'll mention in a moment. Our brassica is basically what's going on in the vegetable garden this time of year, and we want to be aware of a couple of diseases that could look similar to one another. Here's white leaf spot, which would be mostly a problem on turnip, and the one on the right, which would be downy mildew, also shown on turnip here, but can affect many different brassicas. It's caused by hyaloparanospora, which is a fungus-like organism rather than a true fungus. And in both cases here, you're going to want to make sure you're practicing your crop rotation, keeping debris cleaned up, and uh, if necessary, on a preventative fungicide spray program. Also on your brassicas, be aware of, and I've showed these pictures before, black rot, which can occur in this particular photograph on cabbage, but other brassicas as well. Notice how it sometimes will cause a V-shaped lesion and follow the vein. Blackening of, uh, of veins can occur. And uh, although Donnie Mildo, you might get a little bit confused with that one too, possibly. Sclerotinia, though, is fairly easy to recognize with the watery decay, and then eventually the white mat of mycelium forming, and later on, the hard, dark sclerotia. Uh, things to watch out in general, in this uh, time period we're coming up to, mistletoe will be evident for a different species on our oaks and other trees, maples, can even form trunk growths or grow out of the main stem of red maples. And you may see some of this uh, foradendron species growing from doorways in the holiday season, in which case you want to use good judgment about with whom you are standing beneath that doorway. You also want to keep an eye out for unbridled spending and excess calories in the months ahead and for the seed catalogs coming in the mail to you late this winter. Just to repeat our useful websites, Plant Pathology Portal, our boxwood bite light links and our TDIC web page. Oh, by the way, I have the species name for the beech blight aphid here, and you would pronounce it Grula prosypolis imbricator. Anyway, yeah, what he said. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly what, what, what Max said. For for all the wonderful information and excellent images to help help us un understand how it all fits together. We're reaching the end of our hour, so I want to just zip through some announcements for you real quickly. Uh, love for you to join us on a list serve that we have for Extension Master Gardeners around the state. It's ncemgv at list.ncsu.edu. We also have an Extension Master Gardener website, ncemgv.org. Uh, which has statewide information as well as county specific information and is getting better every day. The Master Gardener Intranet, where uh, it's a password protected space for Master Gardeners where there's county specific information as well as statewide information. And we have a strong association of Extension Master Gardener volunteers in North Carolina and ncmastergardeners.org is the website address for the association to stay posted on, on what they're up to. We have a couple of new new portals with lots of great features. This new Extension Gardener portal has taken our Extension Gardener newsletter, put it in the por portal format with an events section that has you know, up upcoming activities. There's a hot news section, featured content opportunities. It has links to the current newsletter as well as previous newsletters. Um, and it's got the showstopper plants that I was telling you about before. We also have a new therapeutic horticulture. This is the website therapeutic-hort.ces.ncsu.edu. We have several counties that have full-time extension agents who do horticulture therapy, and we have a number of additional counties where master gardeners are involved in therapeutic hort, and this is a new resource tool for you with uh, information on, on therapeutic hort. So check it out. <coughs> We have a statewide calendar of, of gardening events now that is searchable, so you can search for things in your town or in your county or on a specific topic. You can look at it in a calendar view, calendar view or a list view. Um, so then this will, is hooked up and will be showing on, on the portals as well. So we're really excited to be, be sharing information there. Upcoming events. We've got the Tri-County Conferences tomorrow in Johnston County, uh, Vermiculture Conference. 
conference is um, this weekend, and the community garden garden partners annual meeting is in Durham uh, on on the ninth. Poinsettia show and sale is at J.C. Ralston Arboretum December tenth. Any other events that you guys have coming up that anybody wants to share? All right. Well, that's that's a wrap then. Thank you guys for for joining us. Uh, this is the last one of the year, and we will be seeing you next year. Look uh, in your email. We'll be sending out a survey uh, to get your input on how to improve the program for next year and get your thoughts about what you like best and, and um, new and different ideas that you want us to include. So that will be coming your way soon.